Hi, everybody. Hi, it's Marisha. Hi, how's it going? Welcome. Welcome. So we started this series to kind of touch base with people about lockdown and their lockdown life. How have you been coping? Who have you been locked down with? What's been going on for you? Um, well, the beginning of the lockdown, it sounds terrible to say, was brilliant because, um, you know, my new book had just fit, had come out in January, the adult book, The Hungry Road. And all the publicity and marketing for that was like crazy in January, February. It was all over the place. We did a lunch in Dublin. We did a lunch in Skibrina, West Cork. And then the end of January, the stage play um, of Under the Hawthorne Tree opened in the Mac in Belfast the end of January and it ran for a month it was on in Belfast I think for nearly two weeks I was up and down to Belfast and then it went to the Wexford Opera House it went to the Cork Opera House and the very last day of it was the 29th of February in Armagh and um, I hadn't intended going to Armagh um, but um, the director said to me to come to Armagh to see the end of the show and Charles Way, who adapted, who was English, had come over for it. And the director actually had a party in his house in Armagh for the, the cast and crew. So I was invited to that. So, and that was literally the day the first person was diagnosed with COVID. And the lockdown came down a few days later. So I was so lucky. The new book had come out, got all the publicity and marketing could possibly get. And did, has done brilliantly and still doing brilliantly. And then the play had come out and toured around. If it had been a few weeks earlier, it would have been a disaster for Cahoots Theatre Company because they'd have had to close down the, the run. And it was playing to full houses in the Wexford Opera House and Cork Opera House and packed out everywhere. So, you know, it wouldn't have been possible with COVID to do anything like that. So I was really lucky. And that had just finished. And um, I'm just saying, this is great now. Things can ease off a little bit. But I was booked for every book festival, literature festival in Ireland um, to talk. So that's a bit sad that they've kind of gone. But actually, my husband and I, we have a lovely big house. And I was glad to have the time to be at home, to relax, to tidy my desk, to um, do the garden. And um, so we had that. And our kids are all live nearby. So they call in and you know, park in the drive when I see the grandchildren in the driveway. But actually my husband like kind of quite like the quiet time. And I'm used to working at home because I, I have my own study here and I work, that's where I, I work at home all the time. That's what I do, you know, bar I'm off promoting a book or something. And um, so it wasn't bad. And we've a, we have a lovely garden and I love the garden. So it was, it was great. But then everything changed. We celebrated 30 years of Under the Hawthorne Tree on the 23rd of May. And the kids came over and we had Prosecco out in the garden. We had booked actually for dinner and everything, which that was all cancelled. So we had Prosecco out in the garden and um, nibbles and everything was nice. And, uh, and the next day, my daughter then um, and her family, they got the burst pipes and moved in with us. <laughs> so it's been two kind of different, to get very, from very quiet and peaceful to bedlam. <laughs> oh my God. So, um, so we're, still, we're still in the bedlam stage. <laughs> So that's coming to an end. So it has been a very different kind of lockdown to what most people would have experienced, I'd say, you know. So this seems like a really stupid question, but have you been able to write? Um, I, well, I had started writing, actually. I was writing for the first few weeks of the lockdown before um, Fiona, or since Fiona arrived, I haven't been able to do anything really, to be honest with the twins. I'm helping with her, but I had started a new book. So I'm kind of about a third to halfway through that. Okay. So um, I'm delighted with that. And now I'll well, hopefully get back to that, get back down to that too. But it's strange because I've been doing a lot of um, stuff online and I've been on the radio. I've been on, t I did the RT School Hub. Um, I've done lots of things which I hadn't expected to do. So that's kind of taken time. I'm learning how to make videos with my phone and things like that. And myself. So it's been a, a new experience for me. I watched the School Hub. I couldn't believe that Under the Hawthorne Tree was inspired by a true Hawthorne yeah. Tree. I, yeah. I have never heard that story oh before. Oh God, everywhere I go in the world I tell that and it was, I was listening at home to the radio and a teacher came on and talked about this little school and taking out a hawthorn tree to make a football pitch and the poor man took it out um, discovering one skeleton and two skeletons, three skeletons and consternation in the school and getting the authorities in because they knew children had been murdered or what happened to them um, and that's totally true and I was listening at home and I couldn't put it from my mind and I kept thinking about them and I mm. felt almost like little ghost fingers hitting me saying we want you to do the book and I'd always been interested in the famine and fairness now and I had told my teacher when I was 12 I was going to write a book about the famine my history teacher but um, no I no I uh, no that was that's true and it's funny because I always think of them and everywhere I go in the world if I'm ever talking about the book and every school I go into I always tell the kids that because they always think it's kind of strange how they come up with this idea of a hawthorn tree and a child buried under a hawthorn tree you know but but that inspired the book it really did inspiration comes from the strangest things you hear or see or, or, or read about you know 
And do, is the book that you're working on now, is it an adult book? No, it's a children's book. I, oh. the, the Hungry Road, the Hungry Road, the um, adult book took nearly three years, longer than I thought. Okay. So much research. So that came out. Now I will be doing, I meant to be another two adult books, but um, I'm doing contacts with them now. Um, but uh, the children's book is one I've been wanting to do for a good while. So I don't say too much about it, but it's inspired by Yeats' poem. That's all I'll say. Oh my yeah. God. I'm so yeah. excited. Yeah, so I'm working on that at the moment. So hopefully I can get that away. And then I, I want to know, I actually want to do one or two, because I'm surrounded by, I'm surrounded by young grandchildren. I have, my eldest little granddaughter is um, 12, but then I have a whole load of little, little ones, little E's now that are very small. So uh, it does make you think about story and writing for them. It's just like I wrote to my own children. So, um, and, uh, and I've been caught up in, like Hungry Road took three years, um, Rebel Sisters took three, three and a half, maybe four year, you know, big research books, you know, so yeah. um, I really want to do a book. I don't need to do any research for it. I can just imagine I don't have to do any research for it. It'd be great to do that, you know. I mean, you were so lucky with The Hungry Road because it, not only did you get it out, but also at a time when more people were reading than they ever were before. Yeah. It's you just, know. it's amazing, and um, I, it got fantastic publicity. And I think people are really keen to find out about the famine and the big story, because it's a big, big story. It's a big, big book and a big story, because it, it goes over so many years and ends up in America. So I think people were ready for a big read, you know, you mm-hmm. know, and it's a big read. And it's quite an, um, quite an emotional read, too, and kind of a bit horrifying when you read it, too, as well, it, writing it even. So I think people were ready for that, and um, it's still selling really well, and people are still reading it, people get in touch about it, so it's great to see it still going. It came out 9th of January, and it's still going great. It's brilliant. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely my experience with The Hungry Road is women my age who loved Under the Hawthorn Tree were just chomping at the bit to get their hands on Hungry yeah, Road. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, so it's like... Book, yeah. <laughs> A new readership, but also us, yeah. you know, and then <laughs> who know that who think that they knew the story or whatever, and yeah. Uh, but it, but I wanted it to be a different story. I didn't want them to be the same, and I wanted the characters to be totally different. So two of the main characters are male, you know, and Dan Donovan and and the priest Father Fitzpatrick, but then Mary Sullivan is an incredible heroic um, person who has you know, really represented all the tenants, you know, that what the way they because everybody thinks oh they were such victims they just lay down and died. When I did the research, they didn't really lay down and die. They fought tooth and nail to live, and I wanted to show that in a book because people think oh the Irish didn't fight back, you know. But yeah. they did fight back. And I wanted to show that, that they tried to stop the food being exported. They tried to do everything. And they were just defeated by the scale of the problem and the scale of the starvation. And then, of course, when when um, the famine fever came, like that was like absolutely, just like us with COVID, they could do nothing about it because they didn't they didn't even understand how, how it spread. They didn't understand people close to contact with spread stuff in those days because they didn't have any understanding of that. They didn't have disinfectants. They didn't understand anything like that about hygiene. So, um was pre Florence Nightingale, you know, so they didn't understand that. So um, that really made a huge difference too. That actually is a really interesting um, comparison uh, with COVID and the famine, you know, in that way of rushing to understand the problem. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, I never thought about it that way before, I guess. Yeah, and- no, just really in the research, like they didn't understand that. Um, you know, if you push people all together into a workhouse or in a, a queuing for a soup kitchen, or you put all people who are weak and sick working on the road roads, they're going to bring the disease and infect each other. And they didn't they didn't have any understanding of that at the time. You know, it, it was it was late years, years later before they'd start to understand that. But they didn't they suspected, but they didn't really understand. And that's why I had, you know, when people stole people's clothes or that that they would get the, the germ from them you know what I mean yeah. and at the end you know so I, I, I was trying to show how but they didn't the doctor did change his clothes I just you know I never read wrote or never read that he did that but he was a highly intelligent man so I just had that when he came in but he would have been really dirty from being in the cottages and cabins anyway so it would have made sense for him to take off those clothes before he went into his own house that he would come home at night and, and put in a new, on a new thing before he'd go into his own family and wife you know and um, so um but uh, it was just um the, the scale of it was immense. Like we, not, we, we, the COVID is nothing compared to what they had to to go through. You know. So you wrote the Hunger Road for three and a half years. Just how much of that? How much of that was research? How much of it was writing? How much of it was? Do you huge, like research? Huge, 
Well, it started off going, yeah, I had said, well, I'd never ever intended to do another family, but my publisher, my children's publisher, Brian Cross, always asked me to do another follow up to onto the Hawthorne tree. But I said, like, I've, I've done the book, I, the three books, I don't know where I could bring it. The next stage would be to concentrate on Peggy in America and the wagon train or something like that, which mm-hmm. that's the thing, I, I would love to you know, follow the wagon train in America. But, um, and I'm like, you know, but, but I kept saying, no, I, I think the trilogy works really well. I think when people try to extend things too much, sometimes it doesn't work and you're better to, you've done the thing that works really well. So I, I put always out of my mind, ever, ever again, doing anything about the famine. But I've been talking about the famine for, well, 30 years. And <laughs> everywhere I went, people would be asking me to explain the famine, especially when overseas, like, what is the famine and how does that happen? And they'd read under the Hawthorne tree, but under the Hawthorne tree doesn't give the political background or the actual extent of the the, the the horror of the famine because the children's book you can't possibly do that but it does capture all the emotion of it and and what happens to children but so I, I kept thinking and I kept saying someday somebody here is going to bring out a brilliant famine book and I'm trying to read it but no one really did one that I I, I really enjoy that much I felt that was good you know so um then I was talking to my publishers and uh, rebel sisters had done so well and they said to me would I do another historical book and I said really I don't want to but then I got the idea of um a one that would be half in the present and it was really about this 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 family in america that had come from ireland originally and that it, somebody died and they had bought this field in ireland and they were going to come back and find this field and then they were going to unravel their famine history of how they went to america so that was the plan and it was going to be called the cottage and it, it's still on my a computer called the cottage <laughs> the book and um it was half and half you know and then so I was trying to write the half half present day and half past. I started writing that. And then, of course, then I started researching Skibreen. I was down in Skibreen. And really, once the minute I read about Dr. Dan Donovan and what people at Skibreen had done, even I'd been at Skibreen almost every year since I was a kid because my uncle and I lived down there. My mum is from there. Um, I suddenly had lost interest in the present part of the story and went into the past and then I said Dr Dan Donovan is such a hero and most people you don't even know him and don't care about him and he's been overlooked by history even people in Skibreen a lot of people wouldn't know about him either you know so um I said he deserves a book and I'm going to put him as one of the heroes of the book and you know build from there and then I found Father Fitzpatrick and then I found out the tenants and the family that had gone to America so it, then I was able to build on that but I wanted her to be different I didn't know how I could make Mary Sullivan but it's funny I just got a picture of her with a needle in her hand and it's, it, you know it's like a Hawthorne tree moment the minute I put a needle in her hand I knew it was a small little implement but that little implement was going to help her fight the famine like it wasn't a gun it wasn't a knife it wasn't a big spade it was a tiniest of things a needle yeah. And I said, but that needle was the difference between life and death for that family. Like, it was just incredible that a needle, the smallest thing you could have, would be the difference between life and death. And it's funny, when you're a writer, you get these um, little things that come to you and you just know yourself. That is the difference that's going to make the book. A needle. A needle. Yeah. That's the difference, yeah. A needle. Yeah, just a needle. <laughs> It's strange, isn't it? It's so strange when you're a writer. It's weird. But it's that's so the weird. thing. Could you imagine if the storyline, she wasn't a seamstress? She was just on the farm. and It would be a different story. But the fact, and the fact she's back and forth to the town and, and then so she can be a witness of what's going on. She's a different witness from the doctor and the priest and from Henrietta. So she's giving a different, and she's going to the soup kitchen. But also, um, she's looking at the people of the town, how it's disintegrating, you know, because it's a different eye. So you always have to have a different eye. And um, putting that needle in her hand, and that had her sewing the shrouds, it had her doing everything. And of course, her hands in ruin doing the ro- roads, you know, the, she was a seamstress and she'd find hands for sewing. But then when she was working the roads, her hands were, were marked and destroyed, you know, and her nails and everything. So, um, and then going to America, of course, the needle was really important because that was going to be part of their, 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 their growth. Their and they went yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it was amazing. Like, I, I was trying to find some way to, you know, I knew she was really strong and heroic and I knew she was going to work on the roads because I read about all the women working on the roads. And then I said, well, what, no, how, I, there's, something, there's something missing. And then I just got a really picture of her holding her needle. And I said, oh, golly, that's it. Yeah. And then the dominoes fell. Yeah, no. yeah. yeah that, that, it's a simple thing. When you're writing, this one little thing happens and it makes the difference in the story. And you always, and hope, and you always hope that happens, you know. Yeah, you're always you're always searching, waiting for that yeah. that moment, that eureka moment. Yeah, yeah. 
And um, did you have you been able to read at all? Yeah, I've been reading a bit. Um, I've been reading a mixture of um, biography and um, fiction. So, um, what you call so that's that's nice. I've been reading. I've been reading both. You know, catching up on both. So, um, and uh, uh, but then you know, I, just found, I found you know, just, I tried to tidy and go back over things and tidy my desk and do stuff. So, and then when you're writing, I find when I'm writing, I don't I don't read as much because I'm trying to concentrate on the book, and you don't want another voice to come in you know so um uh, you try not to do that when you're when you're when you're doing that you know that's really interesting i never thought of it that way yeah no i, I tried to not read really if, if i'm middle of writing a book i and especially once i come to the second half of the book i would rarely read fiction i would just concentrate on the book you know unless i go off on a holiday for a week out of ireland somewhere and then i would maybe yeah. read books to read but when, I, when i'm really concentrating on the book i i don't want any tone of voice to change the voice i'm in my when i'm writing in my head so i don't want any other kind of author's voice coming in on top of me so i i kind of stick to what i'm doing you know i do turn when i get like that i do turn back to the old the old books you know like i definitely i definitely read under the water entry 15 or 16 times i oh would say God. into my life like <laughs> yeah. It's it's one of great. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh stop! No, I'm. I was so nervous. I was like, oh my god, I didn't even read it. Well, yeah. The Boss and Tree is such a special book. It is. Will you ever get sick of talking about it? Do you think, or do you, you get know, sick of talking about I it? I think there's a kind of a magic element to Under the Hawthorn Tree. You know, me hearing the story, me writing the book, and what has, the whole the whole thing that has happened with the book has just been this incredible piece of magic. And um, I never would shy away from magic because it, it, it's a very special book and it, it, yeah. it's changed my life enormously, changed the life of my family and my children. Uh, you know, it, changed, it just changed my life absolutely incredibly. So um, it's a very special book. And to see it, you know, different things happening with it is incredible. To see the stage play, it was brilliant and the music and it's haunting, you know, so it's really, really good. So very blessed with it. And um, I suppose I'm very conscious that when I'm writing other stuff that, you know, that's the launch pad for me to write and to get the best book written that I can do at the time about what I'm writing about, you know. So, um, no, I I, I, am, I just love Under the Hawthorne Tree and I love Eileen Michael and Peggy. And their story is ageless. Like, it's just going from one generation to the next, yeah. you know. I wrote my daughter, my little granddaughter has read it now and, my, you know, the others will read it as they get older. Sam will probably do it next year in school, my little grandson. So, you know, it just... It's lovely to see another generations coming on reading it and more and more people reading it and um, it's just it's gone from me but it's very special I'm very proud of it and you know it, it really um, it's very simply written and in a way I suppose it teaches you writing to keep it simple and keep it um, direct and focused and honest it's very honest the writing in Under the Hawthorne Tree probably too honest you know but um, and I think even when I'm writing out of books I try to keep that element of honesty and and simplicity that um, had it under the Hawthorne tree because I think it, I found my voice very quickly with under the Hawthorne tree and it's helped me through the rest of my career in writing. And is it true that you wrote it longhand? Yeah. yeah at your table? Yeah, I didn't have I didn't have a computer, or, and, and then I had got a typewriter, and I'm horrific at typing. I remember actually when I was younger, I did a typing course for a few weeks at a place called Sight and Sound, and the thing would beep, and I was horrific. I got the lowest scores of everybody. You went into this place. It was my mother sent me to it. Oh, it was horrific, and so I was typing it myself, and I mean, it, it literally every page had to be torn up, and I'd be there with the thing trying to fix it. Um, so there's pre-computers and um, my sister-in-law at the time actually she was uh, my, well, she's still my sister-in-law but um, she was working as a secretary and uh, she was saying how's it going and I said oh, God, so slow typing and she was put into typing and she was oh for god's sake just give it to me and she typed oh. it to me then but I had written it by hand and then I had attempt at typing it all up oh so it's not a very big book it's only I don't know 150 or 170 pages. I don't want pages anyway I never count pages but every page was like it would take me 10 15 20 goes to hopefully get one page that had no typos you know so she said oh, just give it to me and she had it done it's actually brought it back to me two or two days later all typed up lovely so that was great but um no i i wrote by hand and actually um even when i'm working now i work on computer which is great because there's no typos but they can fix but um i still write by hand a lot like i'd write out notes and when i'm writing i I print everything out and then I've gone over writing over everything, the pens and different color pens. And I like having a pen on my hand and writing. So I still would write a fair bit by hand too. You know, I like that. And um, I never wouldn't print out and, and uh, you know, I think when I have it in my hand and with a pen in my hand, I can see it better than when I'm looking at it on the screen, whatever I'm writing, you know. So I think that's just the way I work. 
Yeah, I I love. Um, I just can't. I find it very difficult to sit in front of a laptop and be inspired. Yeah, like I can I can I can fill in gaps on stuff yeah. that I'm writing on a laptop, but I couldn't open a blank page and be like, okay, this is what I'm going to write today. I need to have written something down. Yeah. Um, yeah. To do it on the blank page, that's why I think it's better to start off on a piece of paper, even if it's just, a, you know, the name of the book or characters and what's happening or a little scene. And then that gives you something then to take and open up then the page. And then usually once you do open the thing on your computer, then you're, you get away. But you have to have some little impetus to start you or, and I, that's the thing I like to put on the actual written page, whether in a notebook on a piece of paper or whatever. But yeah, I, I would find it hard to come to just open up a, a blank thing, really. And do your grandchildren like to parade you around? Like, this is my granny, she wrote under the No, they, when they're very small, the smaller ones don't really understand at all. Yeah. <laughs> they're not uh, there yet. Holly now is very good, but you know, they're, they're, uh, they've, they've grown up, my children grow up with it and they've grown up with it, so they don't really pay, pay any heed, you know, and uh, <laughs> they, don't, they just use it, don't care, they don't think about it at all, you know. Yeah. I remember my son, though, when he was, you know, my son is in his 30s now, but when he was younger, he'd say, it's terrible, everywhere I go, people say, and I love your mum, if you met a girl, you know, <laughs> what's your name and she's James Conn McKenna oh I love your mom you know and like, mom, all these girls are crazy about you and everywhere he went no matter where he went to the world and he's someone read under the altar tree and he said oh mom it's just terrible embarrassing being your son you know he was proud of one way but another way not you know so um anyway but uh, no it hasn't made they they're just used to and they're used to writing you know and in, in the house and and they all want to write themselves like you know they're all good writers so and I mean, my, yeah I was gonna ask do any of them have yeah well my daughter Mandy's had two books published now and I'm trying to get to do a third and then Fiona works in film and um, James was in a band and wrote music but now he's working in a big um, computer games company and um, so they're all very creative so they're all very good at writing and then Laura worked doing ads and things on television and things like that as well and designing programs for things so um, they're, they're very creative so um, they're they're all well able to write so that's really good that they're all they're all storytellers you know so oh it's been so nice to talk to you <laughs> I feel uh, I feel like the lo the coronavirus is giving us such a great opportunity to connect. With well, it's people. lovely because I, that's what I'm actually finding I'm doing things I would not expect ever to do and meet people I would never, you know, like that I wouldn't get a chance to. And I find that's really nice things have happened about it and making videos and talking to people and um, and it's amazing how under the Hawthorne tree, I don't know if it's because people have been in lockdown, but more and more people are talking about under the, now it was the 30th anniversary and, and there was obviously, you know, festivals and things planned around that, which were all cancelled. It's lovely now that people are remembering it and talking about it. And lots of people are reading it too, which I think is really good as well. Um, but I think it's great um, that the only thing about the lockdown is people did get reading, did get time for quiet and to think about things. And I'm sure there were lots of people during the lockdown now with this quiet time have started writing a book. They've always said they were going to write a book. They've always thought about writing a book and they've actually got down and, and, and written a book. And I think we'll be seeing those books in the next year or two that people have had the time, you know, they haven't been at work. They haven't been racing on the train and on the Lewis and the Dart and they've had more time. So I think um, one of the things we will see, it may be a year, it may be two years because uh, you probably know yourself a lot of the books which used to be published have been pushed now to yeah. later this year or the following year mm -hmm. so it might be 2022 probably before they might come out but i think uh, we're going to see um, a lot of these people just out of the blue come out with uh, you know novels poems plays film scripts because they'll have had time which they normally wouldn't have had time and time of their own to get their thoughts and and there's nothing to prevent them. There's no, there's no one actually saying, oh, don't do that. You're busy. Come out. We have to go there. We have to. They, so time is really important when you're writing. And I think um, that will be a benefit that, we, that we, will all, we will all see and enjoy in, in about two years' time, I'd say. It's going to be great. There's going to be such an uprising of... And oh, it's going to be, yeah. yeah, there's great, like, um, post-apocalyptic, hopeful stories. There's going to be so many of them. I can't wait. Yeah, I think no, I think I think there will be because I'm sure I'm, I don't know if you know, but I'm sure people are writing and uh, busy with, with books and things they've put off doing and projects they've put off doing. They're going to do it now and writing film scripts because they've had time, which normally time is the bogey when you're writing. You don't have time to do it, but yeah. the time has been given to them now, and uh, and because of lockdown, they can't go out and about and they're stuck at home and bored and just say, well, I'll go do that, you know.
Yeah. Some people have gone tidying their house from top to bottom. Or hopefully some people have gone writing their book <laughs> or their set of poetry or written a, a film script. I don't know. I'm just hopeful. Yeah. I'm an optimist growing as you can Yeah, I was just going to say, like, I'm the latter. I'm a, do they tidy my house? No, not really. <laughs> yeah. so, I had all great plans to all do great tidying, but just, it's a terrible heap now at the moment with the twins and everything and everything. Just, I started with good with good, good intentions, but then it's all gone, gone away now. But I might get my intentions back next week when they're gone well maybe when the restrictions are gone we can have you down to Limerick oh I'd love to do that I'd uh, love to do that because I always, I always love going down there so it'd be lovely yeah, huh? yeah it'd be so great oh, and hopefully okay. hopefully the hopefully the, the talks and the events will come back I, I think they won't be at the massive level they probably would be mm. and um, you know but that's that's okay and um, but I think they will come back and I, I mean the, the big things have to come back to normal we can't live our lives in a vacuum and not seeing people are doing things so I think they will come back and um, I think I think for the moment for the next few months I just I'm talking to publishers they're all saying like there won't be book launches and there won't be things like that it'll be online book launches yeah. never had an online book launch I don't know how that works but anyway but they said it'll be different so um you know, and I was very lucky. So we had got to not one but two gorgeous books. And when I think down in West Cork and Skibreen, oh my God, the Ellen Art Centre, you couldn't move. It's a wonder the ceiling upstairs and collapse with so many people in the place. Oh, it was God. jammered. And I didn't know if people went to turn up or not. And my cousins not were there, but oh my God, it was like jammered. Uh, it would, we'd all be arrested now if we, we if that I was many say, I'm getting actual anxiety thinking about that. We no, it, we were all <laughs> at the time. And then the play like was jammered as well everywhere it went. Absolutely jammered with kids, like every seat gone and sold. So hopefully those things will come back. And I know with the play, their plan to come back at the end of 2021, maybe to Ireland, and then plans to go um, overseas. So we'll see if that happens now or not. I, I don't know. We'll see. But the play is great and the music is fantastic. And it's, it's very good. I'm very happy with the play. Yeah. That's so great. Oh, yeah. thank you so much for agreeing to Thanks, Chloe, for having me. I really enjoyed it.